For most Americans, the Great Depression was a time when people were happy just to make ends meet. It was a time when every day seemed to look hopelessly just like the next. What little industry there was struggled along, even in places like Detroit, Michigan. It was there that Edward Carl Mertz and his wife Thelma had met at the Hudson Motor Car Company. Thelma McCarthy worked in marketing, while Edward worked as a designer draftsman. Their romance blossomed, and in 1932, they were married. By the mid-1930s, Edward had gone on to continue his engineering career with Chevrolet at the General Motors Corporation. Times were tough, all right, back in those Depression years, but with hard work and each other, Edward and Thelma managed to stay on top of things. The year was 1937, and for most people, uneventfully like any other. But for Edward and Thelma, the night of Friday, March 12, 1937, was to be unlike any other night they would ever experience again. It was special indeed, for on that night in Gross Point, Michigan, at 10.20, Thelma would give birth to their first and only child. And so in the shadows of the automotive capital of the world, Edward Holder Mertz had arrived. Those early years with young Edward in Detroit brought much joy and happiness into the lives of Edward Sr. and Thelma. They would devote much of their time nurturing the values and inspiration that although unknown to them at the time, would prepare this little boy for a remarkable journey he would one day take. Born with the inquiring and inherited mind of a designer, and the energy of a restless colt, young Edward Mertz is resolute in the exploration of his known universe. His childhood years are filled with visions. Visions of things to discover, things to learn, things to try. He is not playing, he is creating. And soon, he will march to the beat of a different drum. In 1946, Edward Sr. is promoted to resident engineer at the Chevrolet Commercial Body Plant in Indianapolis. The family moves to Indiana and takes up residence on three and a half acres in the nearby town of Danville. It is here that Edward Jr. will spend his formative years until his graduation from Danville High School in 1955. During his high school years, he develops a keen interest in science and chemistry. It isn't long before the Mertz home becomes the research and development center for many a vision in this young man's mind. Experiments with shortwave radios give way to early computer designs made from erector set parts. Photographic dark rooms are designed and constructed, and electric train sets are magically transformed into dynamic power sources that fuel further ideas to explore. The energy is tireless, and the vision is grand. And finally, recognition at last. Winner of the 1954 Mid-Indiana State Science Fair. Oh, there's time for football, president of the junior class, and editor of the yearbook. But time moves rapidly for Edward Holder Mertz. Important decisions await. It is 1956, and acceptance letters come from Cornell University and Georgia Tech. But it is the third letter that captures his imagination and commitment. And by 1960, he completes the requirements for his degree in chemical engineering from the University of Notre Dame. While at school, his summers have not been idle. With the family now back in Detroit, Ed, with the help from his father, is able to get work at the Chevrolet Engineering Tech Center in the test labs. Still unsure about where destiny will take him, Ed decides, in the interim, on a special short-term critical skills program with the Army in Fort Knox. He fulfills his obligation and a few months later is weighing the opportunities of chemical engineering careers with Union Carbide and DuPont. Again, it is a third opportunity that beckons. He accepts, and it marks the official beginning of a career that will span over 40 years. It will be the only company he will really ever work for. Edward Mertz joins General Motors. The journey has begun. He begins in 1960 at Chevrolet Motor Division in a special program for college graduates in training. 
For the next two years, he will be assigned to the engine plants, foundries, and forges. He will work at assembly plants on detailed engineering drawings. He will learn the business, the business of designing and building automobiles. A special rotational program at Chevrolet provides advanced exposure to engineering, including working with a mainframe computer group. In 1964, an ironic twist of fate takes place. The state of California is very concerned about its increasing smog-related problems. It wants the auto industry to conduct research into the development of emission systems. Chevrolet responds. They need a chemical engineer. They need Edward Mertz. I felt uh, that uh, Ed always came across to me as, a, as an innovator. He's a great guy, good uh, team builder, and uh, he always asked a lot of good questions. And uh, I think he, he made the people that were around him or worked for him to uh, think hard about uh, where things were going and what, what separated him from uh, many other uh, uh, people at that time was the ability to ask uh, pretty insightful questions and also tended to uh, push us uh, in a nice way and uh, press us to, to achieve higher things. For well, the next five years, he becomes immersed in pioneering efforts to understand and control exhaust emissions. His research and testing take him through California, Colorado, and Arizona for months at a time. His efforts do not go unnoticed. Ed is appointed head of the Chevrolet emissions area. And through a series of other rapid promotions, he becomes head of Chevrolet's entire research and development operation in 1970. For well, the next two years, he will do research and development on a variety of unique vehicle configurations. As Chevrolet's chief engineer in research, he will lead the development of a cost-effective one-piece plastic body design. In 1972, Ed Mertz is put in charge of the sheet metal design, chassis, and ride and handling for Chevrolet's Nova and Camaro production group. As part of a weight-saving program initiative, he will lead the development of the first aluminum bumper design. With the redesign of the Nova, he will take the lead in coordinating the shared use of this vehicle platform with multiple divisions. By 1974, his reputation as a reliable and innovative leader is established. Uh, there are two qualities about Ed that uh, I think early on basically labeled him as a, uh, you know, as a high potential. Uh, Ed is, first of all, he's an outstanding engineer and that's been demonstrated in, in many different high-level positions in many different parts of engineering, not just uh, engines. And then probably his biggest strengths are his people skills. Ed has a way of working with people from literally all walks of life, whether it's an individual that's a, a new hire or whether it's a, an experienced individual that's been around a long time and, and high up in the organization. So his people skills uh, really provide what I always term uh, sort of an uncommon leadership uh, characteristic that Ed has always had. Ed was really, he was ahead of the wave on a lot of the, uh, the approaches that we take in, in managing and leading people. You know, Ed was practicing participatory management 25 years ago and of course at that point in time uh, that concept was virtually unheard of in the auto industry and so he's always been uh, he's sort of been ahead of the wave on on the techniques in working with uh, with individuals and specifically with technical people. Edward Mertz will now leave Chevrolet Motor Division for the first time. The move will be to engineering staff. It represents a major promotion for him as he is asked to head up the Corporate Project Center. For the next two years, he will work with engineers from all divisions. The focal point will be the 1978 ACAR program, an important downsizing initiative for the corporation. The program is a success and gets positive reviews, this time from GM's President Pete Estes and Chairman Tom Murphy. In 1977, Ed Mertz becomes assistant chief engineer for Pontiac Motor Division, responsible for several major component designs, including body, front sheet metal, and styling. Two years later, his performance and contribution are again rewarded, this time with an appointment to Fisher Body as chief body engineer. Here, he sets out to improve the scope of communications with the operating divisions. He will later recall this assignment with fond memories. It has now been 20 years since Ed Mertz said yes to that GM recruiter at Notre Dame. 
That was back in 1960. The anniversary is appropriately marked by his return to Chevrolet, where he began. This time, he returns to assume the role of chief engineer for passenger cars. With an extremely competent engineering staff in place and increasing administrative responsibilities, the role becomes less appealing and the need for hands-on involvement still burns brightly. In 1981, he is promoted to chief engineer for Buick Motor Division. In this role, he will be instrumental in the development of the Riata Coupe, as well as the small engine Somerset V6. In 1984, under a corporate reorganization, Ed is promoted to chief engineer with the Detroit product team. The following year, he will head up a manufacturing and engineering operation for the first time as product team manager and will also gain valuable labor relations experience. It is August of 1986, and Ed Mertz will now report for the last job of his illustrious 40-year career. He is appointed general manager of Buick Motor Division and vice president of General Motors. His initial charter is to restore dealer confidence in Buick Motor Division. The Buick vision and image are unclear. He spends the first several months listening, listening to dealers, design staff, and members of the ad agency McCann Erickson. One of the things that I really appreciated about uh, the job that Ed Mertz did for Buick was that when Ed uh, said he was going to do something or committed uh, Buick or himself to a particular project or a way of doing things, it got done. And I guess maybe that's the engineer in him. Uh, you know, us salespeople, we say a lot of things and they don't always get followed up on, but uh, Ed was always the one to get the job done and, and Buick uh, was an extremely well-organized division compared to some of the other companies that we have to deal with. And uh, I'm sure that's because of Ed's leadership and, and his uh, commitment to uh, follow through on, on the pledges he made to the dealer body. In 1987, Ed Mertz establishes the premium American motor car image for Buick. More than 200 product changes are made to new models so they conform to the new image. Business teams are also established for each product line. The essence of Buick display is created to communicate the new image to planners, designers, and engineers, in addition to select dealers and the press. By 1990, under the leadership and direction of Ed Mertz, Buick has established very clear visions for products, people, and customers. They become the cornerstones on which all actions and product developments are based. To help determine the priorities of the day, Ed creates the Areas of Emphasis Initiative. It serves as a daily reminder to all employees on where their attention should be focused. The next two years are marked by accomplishment and personal recognition. The Park Avenue's design changes are seen as a major turning point in Buick's initiatives to conform to product visions. The years are capped off with several awards for Ed Mertz, including Quality Engineer of the Year and National Motivator of the Year. But all is not well. Plagued by troubled cost and income challenges, General Motors issues directives to all divisions to become more internally focused to control costs. By 1995, the corporation undergoes a major restructuring, which will affect its field organization and sound the introduction of brand management. Buick's earlier experience with business teams helps make the transition to brand management very smooth. Buick quickly becomes recognized as a corporate model for their insightful approach. It is 1996, 10 years since Ed Mertz took the reins of leadership at Buick, and many changes have taken place. Buick has a new image and identity, a new field organization structure, Brand management is launched. Many new products are in place. Much has been accomplished. In early December of 1996, Ed Mertz announces his intention to bring his 40-year career at General Motors to a close. His genuine style and trusting manner have won him the respect and affection of employees, dealers, and friends everywhere. This man of many gifts and talents will surely be missed. When asked what he remembers most fondly when reflecting on his 40 years with General Motors, he says he is most thankful for all the wonderful friends he has been able to make over the years and the many interesting people he has had the opportunity to meet. Comfortable with popes, presidents, and celebrities alike. 
yet it is with everyday people that he fits best, for it is in them that he sees himself. When I was offered a chance to say something on a farewell tape to Ed Mertz, I thought I'd point out something. I don't know, Ed, if you remember, but your first official job as general manager of Buick was to come cut the ribbon at Derby South Buick in Venice, Florida. I had the privilege then of riding down with you on the airplane, talking to you, getting to know you as you first came into Buick. It was a pleasure all the years that we spent together to work with you, to have someone that I knew I could call and would give me a fair chance to say what I wanted to say. We're gonna miss you, all of us. And when you think of Ed Mertz, think back to that inspired little boy of visions and dreams. That young explorer who made his dreams and many of yours come true. And for that, Edward Mertz, we thank you. And though there are many dreams and visions yet to pursue, and that the Ed Mertz story is one that is hardly yet complete, at least now, you know a little bit more about the visions of youth that once raced through the mind of a little boy. Visions fulfilled and dreams come true. Hello, Americans. This is Paul Harvey. You and I have watched the recent years accelerated evolution at General Motors with admiration and excitement and with enormous respect for the men and women who chased and caught and passed the best of the best cars in the rest of the world. My hero in this triumph is Ed Mertz. Here was a car man. Ed Mertz came up through engineering to create the incomparable generation of Buicks. Nobody I know is more entitled to strut, to swagger, to boast. But as you know, that's not Ed Mertz's style. He lets his nameplates do the strutting, Park Avenue, Riviera. So, Ed, I am proud to know you, to join your personal and corporate family in saluting you, and I'm letting you say goodbye on this occasion only because you and Alice have promised to spend more time with the Harveys in the beautiful Sonoran Desert of Arizona. So, Ed, treasured friend, I'll see you in a few miles. Good day. You know, even with all of the great achievements we've just seen in Ed's career at General Motors, life there hasn't been without its shortcomings from time to time. One of Ed's favorite communication tools was the bi-monthly curbside chat videos he instituted for Buick dealers 10 years ago. When taping these programs, even his well-known penchant for doing things right would sometimes, well, turn left once in a while. I can see you do have a problem. I suggest you give up golf and go back to selling cars. You don't have to go far <laughs> for your ball. So let's get prepared. You know, the good folks of Texas are promising a glorious time we're gonna be had by all. So I look forward to seeing you all there. Let's start all over again. Welcome to curbside chat number 27. We're here at the Warwick Hills Country Club. Home, let's start, there's a fly that just flew in front of me. Quality press umbrella also covers, let's do that again. Quality press umbrella also covers, let's do that again. Quality press umbrella also covers, hi. Do that again. Hi. Do that again. Hi. It's a tough day on the range. We are on the driving range out here. Today is the pro. Yeah, let me try oh, it again. That was beautiful. Huh? <laughs> How's that? What are you doing back there? Thank you, Welcome to Orient Family Center. Thank you, Steve. Good to be here. Ready to go for your tour? Absolutely. Let's get going. All right. Exciting day here. Let's do that. Yeah. <laughs> Cut. Start over. Thank you, sweetie. 
Three Buick brands saw a year to year, year in. <laughs> the most recent event was the 1995 NADA convention, which just concluded in Dallas. Many of you attended our business meeting on Saturday. <laughs> Close up. <laughs> Hello, John. I can see your tonsils. <laughs> it wasn't that impressive. How you doing today, George? <laughs> Did you change your name, Frank? <laughs> it wasn't that impressive. <laughs> now let me tell you about Larry Peck. That's about it. You know, it's hard to believe that we sponsored our first golf tournament 36 years ago. How many of you? If there's anything anywhere on the continent, on the continent, on the continent, <laughs> they don't trust you guys. It could even take us to the moon. I, I goofed on one line. But as people, people want to be made feel well. So just the pre. This is me. Yeah.